Um, well, Ron is pulling that up. We're going to talk today about managing um, stimulant use disorder and especially in the context of co occurring um, opioid use disorder. Um, and let's see, will this work to advance? Okay, and we have no uh, disclosures to report. This is the information on obtaining this use, CME. Um, and the objectives are to um, describe prevalence of stimulant use disorders um, in, uh, also in general and in patients with in treatment for opioid use disorder. We'll discuss um, management of stimulant dis, uh, use disorder and specifically um, how it is not a, a contraindication for continuing to receive a medication for opioid use disorder. And we'll look at some evidence-based interventions for stimulant use disorders. Um, so just briefly touching upon the epidemiology, the um, data from the United States from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health 2017 showed lifetime use of various stimulants you can see listed there. And just keep in mind as you're looking at these numbers that this data does tend to underrepresent um, the population at large just because of the population sampled in these surveys. Um, but uh, cocaine use at about 15% um, crack three and a half percent methamphetamine, five and a half percent, um, and prescription stimulant misuse, um, not lifetime, but that, that is for past year misuse at two percent. About 200 million Americans report stimulant use, with it, reported it within the last year um, from that data set, and prevalence of stimulant use disorder in the U.S. So in 2011, it was estimated that about 820,000 people met criteria for cocaine use disorder, and 390,000 met uh, criteria for other types of stimulant use disorder. Um, what you see here, is this going to work if I point to it? Yeah. Um, so these slides I realize are kind of small, but this is interesting CDC um, data from 2017 that's looking at drug overdose deaths in the country. And um, what it finds is that um, of the 70,000 drug overdose deaths, about 20% were due to cocaine and about 14% due to other psychostimulants. Um, and this represented a significant increase of 30% greater than the prior year. What you'll see in these slides um, is the relationship with opioid use, um, specifically synthetic opioids other than methadone and um, and then any opioids, so not just synthetic. And what you see here um, in these two slides um, are cocaine-involved deaths with opioids and cocaine-involved deaths without opioids. These are all the cocaine-involved deaths. You can see the steep um, um, increase here, but what you'll notice in the slides that are with um, synthetic opioids, namely fentanyl, and um, uh, with uh, any opioids um, that you're seeing that um, increase um, here as opposed to the ones without that mix, mixture. Um, this is looking at psychostimulants, same relationship here, this is looking at other psychostimulants um, with um, opioids and then um, psychostimulants um, here um, without um, opioids. And this increase is believed, I think, in the more recent data to have gone up even more, but you see the beginning of this steep increase that we're seeing, again, um, uh, most likely related to mixture of uh, fentanyl with these stimulants. Um, the largest increase um, is uh, in um, uh, males between the ages of 25 and 44, I believe, and uh, African-American uh, race most affected in terms of the most significant increase in that time period. So that's just to kind of give you a sense of the landscape. Um, so we'll talk just a little bit about stimulant use in the context of opioid use, and I, forgive me for the wordiness of this slide, but um, as we saw, that we're, we're seeing increased rates of um, fentanyl, not prescribed fentanyl, in patients' urine um, toxicology um, that's also positive for cocaine and methamphetamine. That being said, um, we notice that oftentimes when there are, um, when patients are taking amphetamine of um, methamphetamine, <clears throat> the, uh, this can cross-react in our clinic urine dips um, and appear um, to, in the dip as fentanyl and so may register a positive. And if the patient is not um, 
aware of their the, of being on fentanyl, um, denies any um, recent use of opioids, that it's usually a, a good idea to send um, confirmation metabolites, um, both for um, your knowledge and for patient safety and for their knowledge as well. Um, and this is um, important too because people who use stimulants but may be um, naive to opioids, they're at greater risk of overdose if they're um, either intentionally or unintentionally exposed um, in uh, the uh, stimulant supply to um, fentanyl or another opiate. So they want to, it's important for them to be aware of this um, in order to um, reduce their risk. Um, and along with that, continuously having a discussion about risk reduction. So if it's confirmed, they're making sure um, that they have um, access to naloxone, that their family um, is aware of its location, um, reviewing the importance of if they are using to not use alone, um, things like that. Um, so I think point four is probably the most important point from this slide, which is that the use of stimulants shouldn't be grounds for discontinuing their medication for opioid use disorder. It does make a lot of people uncomfortable, the thought of um, maybe prescribing a medication when you see other um, substances coming up on the urine toxicology. And I would certainly say reach out to us at any point if you have concerns about that. Um, but it's um, certainly as far as their stability, important to continue them on their methadone or um, buprenorphine uh, or naltrexone treatment. Um, the, um, in terms of the prevalence, um, the uh, national data from the 2005 uh, to 2013 range show that approximately, you know, a third of people with opioid use disorder had co-occurring stimulant use. Um, we do see some mixed data with this, but stimulant use in patients um, on buprenorphine or methadone tends to have um, more challenging outcomes, so poor outcomes and lower retention and treatment. Um, however, oftentimes um, um, we see that patients um, do quite well with their opioid use as long as they continue to be um, engaged again in treatment. And um, then finally, the treatment for co-occurring stimulant use should involve the same treatment therapies that are recommended for stimulant use disorder alone, and we'll talk about those in a, in a minute. Okay, and then um, just very brief kind of overview and history of uh, a few stimulants, and uh, we'll just look at cocaine and um, methamphetamine um, briefly here. So cocaine, again, that goes back many, um, well, over a century in, the, in that form, but the indigenous people of Andes have chewed coca leaf for over a thousand years, um, helping with endurance and energy, um, but the isolate from it um, is the cocaine, and that was first distilled in 1855. Globally, it's the second most frequently used um, illicit drug after cannabis, with approximately 14 to 21 million people um, using this per year. And um, it was established basically as an illegal substance, um, track, tracking back to the Harrison Act of 1914 and then the Jones-Miller Act of 1922, restricting its use. Um, and then in 1961, we had the Convention on Narcotic Drugs that um, required countries to make recreational use um, of crime. And then you can see just on the lower part of the slide, the um, the deaths involving cocaine um, in the United States. And this again is showing this up sweep here when we look at those other slides um, um, that most likely is involving the other substances that we mentioned. Here's your coca leaf growing happily in the Andes. <laughs> Methamphetamine was, um, amphetamine was first synthesized in 1887, and methamphetamine was made from ephedrine in 1893. Stimulants first came to uh, the U.S. as benzodrine, which was um, originally um, a bronchial nasal decongestant in France, um, became a prescription drug in 1959, and it was... Um, during World War II, um, fighter pilots were given this to increase their alertness. Um, and then in the United States, it was also um, prescribed for weight loss. About 7% of the population had the prescription for that in 1960. Um, but this changed um, with uh, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention Control Act in 1970. You can see here one of the um, bottles for the fighter pilots. And then um, this here, again, is looking at those national overdose deaths overdose deaths um, due to methamphetamine. And again, here you see that um, increase uh, uh, that we looked at before. Oh, and then just briefly talking about prescription medications, um, about six and a half percent of adults in the US um, 
reported uh, taking prescription stimulants in the past year and 2% unreported misuse, about 0.2% reported a use disorder. Um, and why they were using them, about half um, stated that they um, misused them to increase their alertness or concentration, and also at least half got them from friends or relatives. Um, and then just as a little tidbit here, the first reported misuse of amphetamine was in 1933 by some kids in Minnesota who were trying to keep awake during their exam. So I don't know that this will inform your practice, but I find this history kind of interesting just to see where we've been. So we won't go through all of these lines, but just to remind you the diagnosis of stimulant use disorder, just um, similar to other uh, use disorders, um, we need to have at least two of these criteria in the last 12 months um, that they've been in a, um, their um, typical setting. So in other words, not if they've been incarcerated and um, then just recently out, let's say. But um, this in general is the diagnosis that we're looking for. You can think of it in terms of cravings, um, consequences of use, compulsion to use, um, cite those consequences, and then the evidence of tolerance and or withdrawal. So how do we identify it? Um, I would encourage everyone to screen for stimulant use disorder in your clinics. Um, I think I just saw that USPSTF just uh, recommended this now for all adults, so that's that's good. Um, and we can begin with the NIDA single question screen. It has excellent sensitivity. Um, how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used prescription medication for non-medical reasons? Any positive answer can be followed by a validated screening tool um, that can help us refer patients for treatment as needed. Um, there's, uh, keep in mind that uh, the, for instance, the NIDA modified assist um, can help us characterize the risk of different substances. Um, that's for adults and the craft um, is a validated screen for adolescents. And we're happy to get you more information on any of these if you um, would like. Okay, so this is sort of a sad slide. Um, there's no FDA approved medications uh, for the treatment of stimulant use disorder. We have a few that we, um, this is uh, not all of them that um, people will try off label, but this is um, a list of a few that there have been some studies of. Um, for instance, for cocaine <coughs> use disorder, um, there's been trials of topiramate um, starting at 50 milligrams up to 300 milligrams over 12 weeks um, that showed some um, greater to be greater efficacious than placebo. Um, disulfiram, or otherwise known as antibuse, um, is um, at a dose of 250 milligrams a day. We often think of this for alcohol use disorder, um, especially when given um, in a controlled, sort of observed um, setting. Um, but in this um, particular study, showed uh, that uh, disulfiram plus um, cognitive behavioral therapy showed a significant reduction when compared to placebo. Um, the question of methylphenidate, um, other medications for treatment of ADHD often comes up, but I'm not going into this in this particular talk. However, it is an important question um, in terms of decreasing one's risk of perhaps self-treating with stimulants. Um, and so um, this question comes up a lot in our practice. Um, it has been found that treatment of ADHD with methylphenidate in those who have co-occurring cocaine dependence didn't sh show a worsening of their cocaine use. Um, and then just briefly talking about meth methamphetamine use, um, uh, there's been uh, evidence of mirtazapin as a potentially beneficial medication. I think that this first um, study that's um, cited here, the 30 milligram one, was uh, from San Francisco Department of Health, um, looking particularly in high risk um, uh, sex uh, for uh, men of sex with men, and, and um, this placebo controlled trial decreased meth use with the number needed to treat of, of 3.1. Bupropion has not been found more effective than placebo, but may have a possible effect with light use of methamphetamine. Um, so those are just some um, potential medications um, listed here. So now we'll just talk in the last few minutes um, about what our evidence-based treatment is. And there's been many types of <coughs> therapy studied for stimulant use disorder. Um, so we'll talk briefly about um, each of these. The matrix model um, has been studied quite a bit, but I don't believe it has um, like RCT evidence. Um, and the community reinforcement approach with contingency management has substantial evidence as a treatment mo modality. We'll talk about some the relapse prevention and, um, and then CBT. So just um, the, the matrix model is really an IOP um, 
model, which you may have in some of your clinics um, or have access to. It was originally um, developed in the 1980s and known as the neurobehavioral model um, and was developed for outpatient treatment of uh, cocaine use and, and methamphetamine use disorder. Um, it integrates um, different strategies, um, both individual and group. Um, these include relapse prevention, motivational interviewing, family therapy, psychoeducation, and 12-step. Uh, the group sessions, um, I, I believe it was originally developed for 24-week sessions, but they have a range that have been evaluated as well for effect, um, lasting, I think, anywhere from 8 to 48 weeks. And these do involve group sessions combined with, um, for that 24-week session, for uh, 20 individual sessions. Relapse present prevention as part of this, um, just to touch upon what that is, is, is teaching people how to cope with their use, how to cope with their cravings, <coughs> develop assertiveness and refusal skills, and how to identify um, how their decisions may affect later use um, with the hope of decreasing that. And also importantly, how to um, develop skills to prevent a lapse from becoming a full-blown relapse that could be more um, destructive for them um, and um, have bigger consequences. So just to talk um, about contingency management and community reinforcement, there's good evidence that these are um, effective treatment modalities for uh, stimulant use disorder. Community reinforcement is uh, individualized treatment that's really helping that person um, promote changes that support their recovery. So perhaps identifying the need for marital um, therapy, uh, help with getting a job, how to rearrange their social networks to um, decrease the chance of a relapse. So um, that's community reinforcement. Contingency management is um, an intervention that increases desired behaviors, or I guess alternatively discourages the not desired behaviors, um, by, that should say, by providing immediate reinforcing or negative consequences. So a uh, sort of um, standard example of this is vouchers given for, um, uh, let's say, points towards a certain outcome or vouchers perhaps for a bus pass, different things like that, um, given in that moment for a negative urine tox when the patient presents. Um, and then community reinforcement plus the vouchers approach has really been found to be most efficacious. Um, so three randomized trials show that at least 58% 50, um, completed 24 weeks of treatment versus 11% who were receiving quote unquote standard counseling, so not, not involving this program. And 68% had eight weeks documented negative cocaine versus again 11% who had the standard approach. <clears throat> um, this is also a, uh, a abbreviated list. There are many other potentially beneficial treatments, um, but just to name a few, um, several trials support using CBT for improving outcomes in those with cocaine um, and, uh, and patients on methadone who use cocaine specifically. Um, there's been some look at physical exercise in those um, uh, who use methamphetamine, and this was found um, to some to some extent to decrease use in patients who had a lower severity of their disease and was also found to reduce co-occurring depression. And then um, again, your, your MI techniques are key. Um, so specifically, I think when just one session was looked at, it didn't see, find the evidence of an impact, but four sessions or longer um, were, were found to be um, um, effective uh, in terms of patients decreasing their use, and then MI combined with other brief interventions and referral to treatment. So we'll just, um, the eye on the clock here, I want to make sure we have time for our, our case, and this I believe is our last slide, just with some pearls um, for clinicians. I think that um, because we have uh, limited treatment resources still, and because 
stimulant use disorder is a very difficult illness for people to struggle with in part because of its grasp on the, the neurocircuitry of the brain, um, but um, also because of the complicated ways that it can affect people's lives. And um, it, it uh, can be discouraging for people, um, both patients and clinicians um, alike. And I think that it's important to um, remember that you're part of a community of providers. Um, you're not alone. Um, you're not the police. <laughs> so our job in this is really to be um, supportive of each other and of our patients. Um, I like to recognize the principles of recovery and resilience. Um, and I'll just read these. So each person has innate human dignity. Individuals can recover from a setback. Self-determination matters and individuals are masters of our own goals. And then we'll just end with SAMHSA's 2011 definition for recovery, which you'll notice doesn't include um, you know, negative talk screens, unless that happens to be the person's goal, yeah, stated goal. But um, so this definition is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. And sometimes um, remembering that can be helpful when we're feeling, um, feeling discouraged. So I'll end with that, and I think maybe take a, a minute to see if there's any questions for me or 